Hello everyone and welcome to Stan the Wine Man TV. I'm your host, Stan Rattan, aka Stan the Wine Man. You know, I was thinking about when I started calling myself Stan the Wine Man and I got to thinking about it and I remember that my good buddy Clark Gilbert came into my wine shop. I had a wine shop for a brief period of time and he said Hey, Stan the Man, Stan the Wine Man, and that kind of, kind of stuck. So in our small community here on San Juan Island, pretty much everybody calls me Stan the Wine Man. Today, we are going to look at Argentinian Cabernet Sauvignon. Now, I've gone on a tangent about this on my blog many times, and... I feel that Argentina may be making the same mistake that Australia did with Shiraz. They pumped, I mean Australia pumped the world with cheap Shiraz. And eventually people got tired of it. We can only take so much of that stuff. Now, it, granted, there's still good inexpensive Shiraz out there. But you got to remember that you know, you can saturate the market, and they did it. And as a result, even Syrah has suffered because of that. Many people, you know, they quit drinking Syrah because they just got tired. Well, that's after wine guys like us had to convince everybody, yes, Shiraz is Syrah. It's not some special grape from Persia. And once we finally taught them that, they got tired of it, and they go, well, I don't like Syrah then. So I'm afraid that Argentina may be going in that direction. I've already seen, at least at my store, a decrease in um, uh, Malbec, uh, inexpensive Malbec. So they're, they're still okay, but they are starting to taper off a little bit. And that's too bad because Argentina should be known for more than just inexpensive Malbec. In fact, uh, they make some tremendous uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, Tarantes, the white of Argentina, is delicious uh, wine. Uh, they do Bonarda, which I love. Actually, Bonarda reminds me quite a bit of Syrah. So they have uh, quite a few things to offer, and I think they would do themselves good if they uh, promoted some of these other wines. So we're going to take uh, three Argentinian uh, Cabernet Sauvignons and give them a try. Today I'm using my little... Um, Cool little plastic wine glass. For some reason, I, the, the name is escaping me. Sorry, guys. Anyway, cool little thumb handle, great for boaters. You know it does well here because this is a huge boating community. So let's uh, give a little rinse to the glass. Now, by the way, these glasses, if I could remember the name of Govino, that's it, Govino. A little plug for those guys. These actually are very, the bowl shape is good for drinking wine. I use them a lot at home. Uh, just in case I drink too, no, not really. Uh, no, they're re they're really good. They have they give a good bouquet, all that stuff. So I'm doing terrible with this zoom thing. Sorry about that, guys. I'm trying to get it right. So I need to be a little bit lower. I know that. And let's zoom in on this. This is a 2011 Tomero Cabernet Sauvignon from Mendoza, Argentina, and it rolls in at uh, about uh, 13 bucks. Yeah, 13 dollars. So let's give a little zoom into this label. Hopefully I do it good this time. There you go. Hopefully you can see that. Now I'm going back. Okay. Please bear with me. I know that I've had a few people uh, watch my video and I'm trying to get it right. Um, this one has actually 15% alcohol. I'll be curious to see how that uh, fleshes out for us. Uh, Tomorrow is a great, uh, they, they do a good uh, Malbec at the same price point. The nice part about Argentina is that um, it's a, all the vineyards are fairly high altitude, some of course higher than others, but Argentina is up there in the altitude wise, so you get a lot of uh, good fruit quality uh, from Argentina. But let's give this one a smell here. So immediately I get uh, currants and cherries, but it's good. It's, uh, it's really uh, kind of brooding aromas of cherries and currants. It's, it's, it's not bright, it's, an, it's on the dark side, the Darth Vader side. 
By the way, they're, I hear they're going to start the uh, new third part of the trilogy of Star Wars. It's going to be pretty cool. So I get a little, um, yeah, a little vanilla, not, not a lot, but I get a lot of that uh, cherry currant thing going on. Let's give it a whirl. Alcohol got me in the back a little bit, not a lot. It's actually pretty balanced. Um, I get a, of course, very smooth on the palate. Um, it's got a richness there um, for for thirteen bucks, an amazing richness. I'm getting a little bit of like a, there's oak, and the oak seems to be like pushing down the fruit just a little bit, but still get a lot of tobacco, cherry, currant flavors. Uh, they're there. I think they could pop a little bit more. Maybe um, this is a 2011, uh, maybe in another year, this one, will, the, those fruit notes will maybe overtake that oak. It's kind of like somebody... You know, you're walking over a really good, <laughs> with a plank over some really good juice. It just, it's not allowing you to dip in as much as I think is there. At the very end, you get like a, it gets a little brighter. More of the cherry comes out, almost like a red cherry thing. Again, that oak is present throughout. Um, it's got good restraint. Um, yeah, I, you know, it's, it's a good wine. It's polished. Um, you get that oak, but it's not overpowering. Um, the fruit is there. Actually, it's lingering on my palate for quite a while. Yeah, a lot of tobacco on the finish. I think with this wine, what I feel like is it's like, uh, remember in Rocky, when Adrian finally took off her glasses and let down her hair, you go, wow, she's, she's not bad looking. Um, it's like the oak is like the glasses and the bun. You know, it's just kind of masking some of those flavors. But that being said, I think that for 13 bucks, this is a pretty good cab. I mean, it's not... You know, it's delivering the length of the finish, the, the alcohol. There's a little bit of a burn on the backside. So, so for some of you guys that maybe avoid that, you might not like it. But, you know, this Tamaro Cab, I think I'm going to give it a C+. Now, I would give it into the B category if um, there was a little, just a little bit less oak expression and more fruit. But, good bottle of wine, C+, is not a bad score. Um, it always reminds me of my stepfather who used to tell me, you know, C students are the best students, you know, because I used to, well, I'm no bragging here, but I used to, I was an A student, at least most of the time, and um, he, he, for some reason, he just was always wanting to put me in, a, in my place, you know, not to think I'm special or anything. Anyway, C plus for Tomorrow 2011 Cabernet Sauvignon. Next wine is uh, Domaine Bosquet, or Bosquet, I'm not sure, probably Bosquet, or Bosquet. I bet you it's Bosquet because the family that owns this is a fourth generation French family. So let me zoom in on this one for you. See if I get the right spot. Okay, can you see that? Chat Domaine Bosquet Cabernet Sauvignon. 2011 again Mendoza Argentina you'll see that on almost everything except this one is from the Tupangato Valley of Mendoza and it says it's made with organically grown grapes that's pretty cool for those of you that are uh, into that sort of thing uh, let's uh, give it a rinse here 
So I looked this up, did a little research on this one because I wasn't even I wasn't even sure where I got it. There's another thirteen dollar um, cab. I always hate that when I forget to write down in my notes where I got this bottle of wine, or they don't write it on the back. Anyway, let's put that over here for you. Now this. Yeah, looking this up, fourth generation French, so obviously they have a French wine influence one. This one only rolls in at about 14% alcohol. I love, now this, to me this has a very interesting aromas on it. I get a little menthol, you know, like a little toothpaste action going on. Some, some write in their notes pencil shavings to as a kind of a minty, the pencil lead for mint. But I think, I, I just, instead of saying pencil lead, I usually say mint. God, getting some really interesting aromas out of this one. Mint and currant, little, almost like a mincemeat sort of thing going on. Mm, I like it. I like it. I do. I always like it when, when you smell one, and it's interesting. And I, I think I said this in my first episode, but it's really important to take a little bit of time and smell the wine. I know it seems kind of wine geeky and all that, but it's important because it, it really helps you to, your palate, prepare for that wine. It makes it more interesting, and for those that just pop, glug, 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 drink it down. I think you're missing just a little bit. I mean, it has so much more to offer than just that. If you just take a minute and just smell it. Practice at home. You know, so that when you start doing it in, around, in the public and people can see, you don't feel so awkward doing it. This has a little meaty element to it. Uh, but a lot of currants, mint, meat. The mint isn't overpowering, don't get me wrong, it's just there. It's, it's good balance, I like it. Okay. Definitely more expression of the fruit on this one. Uh, it, it, it's got a lot of red flower, kind of um, currant. The mint isn't in the palate, but it makes it fresh. You know, it has that freshness on the palate that kind of brightens it up just a little bit, but it's still got that fruit. I'm getting a little bit of a black licorice component. Like I said, it, it kind of pops on the palate, kind of just like... It's like somebody's shining a light or, you know, it's just a little bit of a, maybe a steely sort of thing going on on the backside. Um, the fruit is there. It's, it's, it's polished. It's not quite as, uh, it, it really comes to life on the palate. And um, I like the, uh, the current cherry tones are just, it's, it's very, um, it has, it's backed by those, um, uh, Argentinian wines have what I call a chalky tan and it's a, uh, it's not really gritty or grippy, but it's it's there. It's like a, a mineral edge to it. And this definitely has that. There's definitely a minerality to it. I'll get on that whole minerality thing someday. That should be in the dictionary. Everybody uses it. A little shout out to Kylie Pittman, who thinks that you should never use the word minerality in describing a wine. Sorry, Kylie. I'm letting you down. I use it all the time, and it's definitely on this cab. At 13 bucks, this is quite a bit better than the Tomero. I like it a lot more. I think it's it's got all the elements that uh, the cab drinker would look for. It's got a freshness on the palate, which tells me that maybe after a couple, three, four years, this will soften up. Maybe more of those dark fruits will take over. But you know, you don't have to have the patience for that if you don't want. But you know, at 13 bucks. Buy four or five bottles, put three away, drink a couple, see how they do after about four or five years. That's always fun to do. I don't think a lot of people um, 
I have quite a few customers that say, I can never, I can never keep them down that long. Well, you know, just, just try and put them somewhere where you'll forget about them. Some, some place that stays relatively cool, but not, you know, the, the temperature doesn't fu fluctuate too much. Ooh, gotta be careful when you say that word. Nice wine. I even get a little tobacco on the mid palate, just a touch of tobacco. Good wine. I'm going to give that one a B plus. That is an excellent bottle of Cab for 13 bones. Now we're getting up into the upper side of the price range. The Catina Alta Cabernet Sauvignon from the Estate Rose, uh, high altitude, selected by Bodega Catina Zapata. So I'm going to give this a rinse. Now, for some reason, and I'll post it on, on the bottom of the video, but I believe this one rolls in at, in, in about a little over 25 bucks. Might be more than that. Just look at the bottom of the video. I'll write it in. I, for some reason, forgot to look that up. This one also has 14% alcohol. The Catania family, now let me zoom in on this so you can see the label. The Catania family is one of the largest family-owned wineries in Argentina. They have a ton of labels. They do Tilia, they do Zapata, they do the Catania Alta, they have a, a, a number of other ones that they do. Uh, High, High Note Malbec is one of theirs. But they're big. But they also have quality. They haven't let that go to their head. They, they definitely produce some excellent wines. In fact, uh, the Tilia Malbec was my pick of the month last month here at the store. So, um, yeah, good wines. But I want to try this Coutinho Alto because this is their upper echelon. Their Zapata goes for over $100. And I, let me post the price on this. Don't quote me on that. I don't, I'm sorry I didn't write it down. I wish I would have. But I'll put it in the bottom of the video for you. So immediately on this one, you, you get a sense of a, a richer style. Um, there's definitely more layers on the nose. This one goes towards more the uh, current uh, blackberry side of the realm. I get tobacco for sure. I get a little vanilla, which would indicate oak, of course, but not a ton. Almost a chocolate sort of element coming through on that one. Mm -hmm. Rose petal. I get that like, you know, like they mashed up some rose petals and buried it in the currants and the blackberries and kind of stirred it up and even a little spice element. I can't quite identify the spice, but it's there. Mm. Now that's See, sometimes I've gotten in such a habit of smelling wines, I could just smell them all day. I mean, really. This has got a good nose. So if you ever buy a bottle of Catina Alta, definitely take time and smell it. Okay, let's give it a whirl. Okay, the oak is definitely present on this one. It, it's a dominant factor on this wine, which makes sense. It's a bigger wine. It's a 2000, did I say the year on that? Okay, it's a 2009. Whew. I know they released this later. Definitely a lot of oak. Almost get like a well, like a, a cherry blueberry currant thing going on. Very interesting. I don't usually get blueberry out of a cab, but that just seems to be there. It's got tobacco for sure. There's just an underlying brooding. This could be a monster in a couple more years. Very Bordeauxish. Is that a word? Bordeaux. 
I use. A very Bordeaux-like, I should say. Um, like I said, the oak is definitely there. Um, it's very prominent on the palate. But there's enough fruit, enough things going on. And the, the finish lingers for quite a bit, but I get that grippy kind of oaky tannins on the back end. You're familiar with that? And, and actually, took a little sandpaper hit on the top of your gums. It's there, for sure. But it's not so bad that it distracts from the wine. It's not like you get this big, like, like this gigantic oak hit. But, but it's definitely there. I think this bottle needs to be laid down probably for another four or five years, three to five years to allow that fruit to come out of there. Like I said, it's got good balance. It's definitely well made. Um, it's a little more expensive than these other two. And in fact, I would, if I had a choice, I would go with this one over this one, just because this is 13 bones. This one is up in the, uh, above 25. But for the, the level of wine that this is, with the potential that that has. At this point, I'm gonna give it a B plus. Just because I think the oak is a little too strong on it, but not, eh, maybe, yeah, B plus. Let's, let's stick to B plus. I would go B, in my notes I'd put B plus, A minus, because I'm kind of undecided. Because I see the potential in this wine, it is well made. Oak is pretty strong right now, but give it a couple more years, I think that, that the fruit will flesh it out. It'll integrate a little bit better. I know it's an 09, it's already four years old, but you know, that's the way wines are. That's the way these guys make these things sometimes. All right, that's it for today. I'm glad you uh, joined me, and I hope to continue doing this. I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying tasting these wines on, on, online. And here is to keeping the snob out of wine. Cheers. Ciao.